Welcome to The People's View, a program dedicated to discussing local, state, and national issues and their effect on the American people. The People's View provides a platform for state representatives and national figures to present their viewpoint. Whether it's social, economic, or financial topics, you'll hear it on The People's View. Welcome to The People's View. My name is Carl Seidel. I'm one of the hosts, along with Kevin Avard. And uh, today, uh, we will be interviewing the mayor of Nashua, Mayor Lazo. Lozo, excuse me, <laughs> mispronounced it. But uh, Mayor, tell us about what's happening with the budget and things in, uh, in uh, Nashua. What is, what's the highlight on your menu of things to do? Oh boy, how do you pick one out uh, of all of them? Well, it's nice to check off the state of the city address. Uh, you know, that's a lot of time goes into trying to get that right and, of course, strike the right balance of giving as much information as you can without giving too much information. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I spent a lot of time this weekend cutting words out of the state of the city. I cut out like 3,000 words, and still when I presented it to the chamber, it was a little bit lengthy. But it's because there's just so many things happening mm -hmm. in the city. We're so, you know, we're so lucky. Uh, things are happening with road projects, things are happening with rail projects, things are happening with the budget, things are happening with the downtown, um, things are happening with businesses. You know, it, it feels good in Nashua. It feels mm -hmm. like there's a lot mm -hmm. going on. Right. So, of course, you know, the next big thing after the Irish breakfast, which <laughs> gives me <laughs> plenty of angst there as well, I'm just Yeah, saying. we were talking about that last night on Gate oh, City Chronicles. People That's... don't realize, it's just, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of pressure, actually. Oh, yeah. So I, my state of the city is less pressure than the Irish breakfast. Oh, no. Um, well, it feels <laughs> that way, you know. But anyway, um, is the budget, of course. Yeah. So we'll um, get the budget put together. The departments are working on it now, the divisions and departments. And so I anticipate uh, that coming in over the next couple of months internally. You know, we go through a process, and then it'll be introduced to the Board of Aldermen at their first meeting in May, uh, and then we'll begin the hearings and the meetings then, mm -hmm. and we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, my first um, ask of the departments is a 1%, but one of the things that we do is we work as a group, a collective mm -hmm. group, and so I have what I call my cabinet, and we talk about what are the needs and demands of the different divisions and departments. So in the past, as you know, I've, I've never cut the school budget, mm -hmm. but they've worked really hard to try to get as close to my request as possible. Uh, now, I, I've already met with them to talk about, I know that they're looking at 2%, mm -hmm. and I've asked them to give some thought to 2015. Uh, because as you know, both of you having served in the legislature, the retirement system gives its uh, number every two years. Mm. So the increase this year is 26%. $3.7 million, uh, that's going to be a hard mm -hmm. hit. That's, that's huge. It, yeah. You know, it, it is. And so we know that that's happening now, but in 2015, we know that's not going to happen. I guess I probably shouldn't say that. Is there any wood close by? <laughs> um, at least they don't normally, it's a two-year yeah. cycle for them. Um, so that gives us an opportunity to plan a little bit for things that might be able to come in in the 2015 fiscal year instead. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know, those are the discussions that we'll have. Um, I think it's important that we all work together. Um, you know, it, it concerns me um, when other departments don't recognize the challenges of others. And so we do a lot of uh, conversation around that. I mean, a couple of years ago when the budget was really, really uh, difficult, uh, we sat as a group and we talked about, you know, what does it mean if you close the library on a Sunday? Mm -hmm. Is it worth mm -hmm. those dollars? And, you know, we, I, I think we made some good choices, and, and I think it served the city well. Good. And, and talking about the school department, have, are they forecast to have less students or more students uh, for the coming year? Well, actually, Nash was holding steady with their number okay. of students. They're not really seeing a decline. One other communities other. are, yeah. uh, but they're not. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think they're pretty much holding steady. I think there are differences within grades. Um, if I recall correctly... I probably shouldn't say it because I don't really recall correctly, but I think one group is a little bit up uh, and another group is a little bit down, but collectively it's... Well, how does the, uh, this uh, proposal for uh, scholarships that might take some of the students into, uh, from the regular public school to a charter school going to 
feed into this whole budget question? Well, you know, the first thing I think about is the cost of transporting those students. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, we did have to put a significant amount of money into the budget this mm -hmm. year to um, bring kids to the new charter school. I guess it's not new, but it's new to Nashville. They moved from Merrimack into Nashville, the Academy of Science right. and Design. And although I support charter schools, I think it's a great idea. I don't want them at the cost of our public schools. So, you know, it's, uh, it's about striking a balance, like most things. Right. Um, so the first thing I think about is, okay, there's some, could be additional transportation costs. Does that mean that our student population will decline? I don't think it'll be significant. I don't think you'll see a lot of people say, oh good, I'm gonna move my mm -hmm. child here. I mean, I think that typically you might see shifts uh, middle school, high school, uh, but generally people I think try to keep their kids but, in a stable. But even, even the public schools can, can, can compete for that scholarship money, can't they? I don't think so. I think this is if, only to go to outside of the public school because I, the public schools have some money, some of their allocation from the state, which mm -hmm. is what, 13000 per student or something? I, I know that Nashua well, gets $35 million. Uh, that's a big number, sorry. Right. <laughs> and we uh, have 13,000 students. It, so. it's, it's less than 50% 50, 50 of what the state gives to the school. Oh, you're talking about the adequacy money. Adequacy oh, money. Oh, so we get about $3,500, I think, right. yeah. per student. I, I was under the understanding that, that the, some of the public schools can, if they have a particular program, that they can... Oh, a special program? Yeah, or? that they, they could actually, those, that scholarship money could actually fund the education in, into uh, one of that the... That I hadn't heard. Yeah. I don't know if that's I, true. I think we always talking to Kate Baker But I know there's that. not a, uh, a lot of understanding of that. Right? Mm -hmm. People are always saying it's going to cost our schools, the local schools, money, and I don't think it is because they're still getting some of that adequacy money. Right. Uh, the uh, uh, other part of it is that they've already, uh, the state, state isn't going to be losing any money. It's going to be costing them less because they won't be giving as much to the, they'll give some, but they won't give all the money to, uh, for each child that leaves the school system. Hmm. Uh, so they're, they're saying that uh, if they uh, reverse that whole program, it's going to be costing the uh, state uh, 50, what is it, fifty million dollars or something like that, some number. Yeah, I, I have not looked at it closely. Okay. I have to tell you. I was really just wondering if that was coming into if the, there was any kind of uh, feeling in doing the budget that uh, they're allocating X dollars or something that's a significant portion of it. Well, I'm budget. sure that the school board will probably talk about some of those things and what the impact is, and then when they present their budget to me. Then you, they'll they'll tell then me more know. about it, okay. but in the meantime, I try to um, I try to set the parameters that I'm hoping that we can work together in. Well, let's let's get to some of the things that are in the city. Then uh, your, your beautification program, I think, yep. has gone very well along the downtown. Main Street downtown, and everything. Yep. What are you going to do with the dungeons you found? Over oh, there? <laughs> well, I don't think we found any dungeons. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we certainly have areas uh, in the downtown where buildings have what they're calling. Uh, vaults or rooms mm -hmm. that are under the sidewalk and <clears throat> people have said to me how's that possible and part of it is because hmm. you know back in the 70s when they widened the sidewalks because you know they used to be pretty narrow mm -hmm. which meant you know if you really figure it out the vaults or whatever they are were still underground mm -hmm. uh, and even with a more narrow sidewalk they were still there but when the city came and widened the sidewalks, they really didn't do anything about it. They just kind of excavate, excavated and then made them wider. And in some areas where they had bulkheads, things like that, they pulled some of those out, put in two by fours, put in plywood, covered it up. And of course, that's rotting after 30 years. And right. I say city, meaning um, not meaning that we necessarily had city forces doing it. Um, my understanding, the best that we can put together now, it looks like a contractor came in and and did a lot of that work. So what we're really trying to do now is we have a structural engineer that's coming on board and they're gonna take a look at what all of those um, challenges are, we'll call them, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's replacement of a bulkhead, closing one up, looking at a room that might be underneath. Um, and then of course also making note of everything, that you know, what the conditions there. are. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you don't wanna be doing work on the sidewalk, have a problem, and then have the property owner say, well, Yep. You know, that crack was never there until you got here. And somebody said to me, like Daryl's? And the answer is no, not like Daryl's. Daryl's didn't have a room under the sidewalk. Uh -huh. Everything was fine with Daryl's, we, but we had put down a layer of gravel and sand and things like that. And 
We had, then we had put down, I think, uh, I, I think the concrete might have been there, but we hadn't, uh, and we thought we had sealed everything that needed to be sealed, and we didn't. And so water, um, I mean, you had that, you know, hurricane force, rain, storm, water coming from all different directions, and it got in. And it just got into their basement where they had pianos and other things, and it caused some damage. And, oh. you know, uh, it's unfortunate. We certainly didn't want to have to do that, um, meaning, you know, pay for those costs. But it, it was the right thing to do. And you can't take on projects like this and, and not have some things that don't go as, right. as you'd hope. So we went in and resealed it, worked with Daryl's, and, and it went very well. But we want to make sure that we know all those things ahead of time. We I'm did know that Daryl's didn't have water damage. Mm. And we did know that it was a really bad storm. And we did know that when we came, there it was. was. A, I'm sure they're, they appreciate the beautification of the, of the town, too. Oh, though. no, it's looking. Oh, no, and they've been terrific. I mean, right. they really didn't give us a hard time. Yeah. Um, they, they, you know, understood that sometimes things happen. I mean, you know, you have an act of God and an act of man together. Somebody's going to, you know. <laughs> God so, wins. Well, always. <laughs> I, I, I don't disagree, but, you know, I, for whatever reason, right. I guess I'll blame it more on Mother Nature, yeah. who he's given that responsibility over to. But... Uh, but the work that's going down um, downtown, people just love it. I mean, I, I get a lot of positive comments, the mm -hmm. safety, the walkability, the new light poles, uh, all those things. Well, and so. What about the rail? Uh, uh, can you update us on, on, on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Uh, as you know, the, the study uh, is moving forward. That's about an 18-month study. Mm -hmm. uh, so I anticipate um, you know, that moving along as planned. In the meantime... We're still pursuing a couple of other options. I'm a big fan of, you know, making sure that you preserve any options that you can have so that, you know, when you come to the table, okay. you, you get to choose. You're not, you know, hamstrung or cornered by something else. So we're, we have a study happening right now on Exit 36 South, uh, which is an exit that we'd like to have that has been identified by the state some years ago, before my time, about being a good option for... Mm -hmm you know, relieving the traffic problems on Daniel Webster Highway and Spitbrook Road. Yep. Uh, so for people that don't understand what that, uh, they understand the traffic, of course, but what they might not understand about 36 South and its benefit is, so for those of us that might find ourselves on a very busy weekend heading down to the Pheasant Lane Mall, we'll stay on the highway and go into Massachusetts. Get off the I've highway. I've done it. Flip, right? <laughs> I've okay. done it. I don't know how many times. So if we put in a 36 South, we won't have to do that, and mm -hmm. we'll come out in that same place. Right. And that's really what we'd like to see happen. Hmm. Now, one of the opportunities that that might present is that it might demonstrate that it's viable for a multimodal transit center. Mm -hmm. So we might be able to talk to MBTA and have the train come up to uh, Tingsboro. For us, we'll feel like it's Nashville, at least close sure. enough for now. Right. Uh, and, and then we can also see what that means. Yeah, they might get more people going to Boston. Right. Just, just. Well, you know, I, I, people do talk a lot about that. But one of the other things I think it's important for people to think about is we have a lot of companies um, at Exit One uh, in the technology park and some of the other places who benefit from sharing that uh, software engineer quarter, let's mm -hmm, call it. Right. I mean, we have in our region, um, it's a four to one ratio of engineers compared to other regions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they want to be able to grab from that pool of skilled workers. So Dell, every time I go in to see them, so how's that train coming? <laughs> because they want their employees to be able to come up on the yeah. train. Mm -hmm. right. uh, places like uh, Aspen Technologies, who has a facility in Burlington, Mass, and up here. Yep. Well, they want to be able to send their people back and forth mm. uh, without getting on the highway and, and having those other associated costs. So. You know, I, I think it's really um, a lot more options than people might think about. If the report comes back in 18 months and says, you know, that we should have rail in New Hampshire for whatever distance, I think hard decisions have to be made, operating expenses, things like that. Yeah. We've uh, purchased, uh, or at least we're trying to purchase, we have a purchase and sale on a Crown Street location for, a, for an immediate park and ride. Uh, because believe it or not, coming over that East Hollow Street Bridge, 38,000 cars a day. That's more than we have at the park and ride at exit 8, and it's more than we have at the park and ride at exit 5. So there's an opportunity there for people that are mm -hmm. coming that way to, to meet collectively as a group and finish the trip together to look at whether or not it makes sense to have our public bus system do some work, pick people up, bring them to different points, you know, what might be viable there. And then if the report proves true, and let's just say, for example, that the rail goes all the way to the Manchester airport, it's really important that it stop in Nashua. 
And our East Hall Street master plan that was done back in 2003 demonstrates that this is a great area to have it. It's got enough straight track. Uh, we didn't think that this parcel would come up for sale. And when you see something like mm -hmm. that, you want to be smart. You want to be ahead of the curve. Uh, and you and you hold on to it. And that that's really where we are now. Uh, I don't want to be a landlord, right. uh, but I want to preserve our options. I want to be smart about it. You know, I, I, I use the example for people a lot of um, Henry Burke Highway. Mm -hmm. So Henry Burke Highway, you know, one can drive that and realize that it was probably never intended to dead end into Concord Street, <laughs> right? So if you really looked at the plan there, it was supposed to continue and be a, a, a North Bridge crossing. Mm -hmm. And all the property on the <coughs> other side has been purchased. But Nashua allowed a whole neighborhood to grow up there in between those two mm -hmm. points. I used to play there when I was a kid. Right? Yeah. So, but you built all these houses. All, and now in order to do that, you'd have to effectively, yeah. Yeah. you'd have to take out almost two streets. Mm. Well, we should have been smart. And right. we should have planned ahead. E even if people yelled and screamed about spending the money, we should have been smart enough to hold on to a piece of that development enough so that when something like this was ready to be done, we were ready to go. Hmm. Wasn't I, the, and I look at it the same way. Yeah. That yeah. North Bridge, wasn't there some tie-in too with the exit nine on the turnpike? Where was it, that it, planned? Um, you know, I'm not, sh it, it might have been exit nine. I'm not exactly sure. The one sure. that's not there. <laughs> right. Um, but. I mean, I, I look at, the, like, I'll tell people, you know, if we had a full-build circumferential highway from back in the day, yeah. we probably wouldn't have needed a Broad Street Parkway. You know, and that, yeah. and that full build had a North Bridge yeah. in it, too. Yeah. So now, you know, those discussions are moving towards Merrimack to find out, is there another way to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. That North Bridge is the only way that we're really going to take care of the traffic problems you on Canal a, yeah, Street, and Lock terrible, Street, and all that yeah, area. Mm -hmm. Terrible problem there. Right. Well, uh, would that tie in with a, a rail station then at this new property? Exactly. I mean, is that exactly where you want to have people coming in? For uh, Crown Street, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think it depends uh, what they call that kind of station. So let's just say, for example, um, we are fortunate enough to have the multimodal transit center at exit 36 South. Let's just say that that's the case. And then it is going to go to Manchester. Well, Crown Street will become more of what they call a kiss and ride, where you'll just be dropping people off, okay. you know, because there are other arrangements are being made. So it's a quick stop in and out, unlike what 36 South would be. Mm -hmm. That'll have buses and trains and all kinds of different options. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the other benefit to Crown Street is the way the development happens around a train station. They call it transit-oriented development. So it'll be a mix of housing and commercial. And, and that's what you see There's there now. There's a number of that around D.C. Right, like right, that right. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that we have an opportunity for. And with the new development going across on the other side, and, of course, our problem there at East Hall Street as it is over the bridge, where we have, there's a traffic circle mm -hmm. that's in the 10-year plan that's moving forward. And now we're actually looking at that, and we're trying to find out, can we make it more than a traffic circle? And what I mean by that is, can we make it a sustainable uh, piece of that area of the city? So if you look you at that parcel, well, but we also have, um, I'm talking in the green world, we also have two pump houses there. We have one that Penichuk has. We have one that the city has. We have stormwater issues. We have detention pond issues. We have a lot of things like that. Could we incorporate that all into a traffic circle mm -hmm. that, that, that addresses all of those competing demands there and have this sustainable traffic circle that takes care of stormwater and sanitary overflow and, you know, really yeah. does the job? And um, I, I think that's a, that's a really unique possibility. I, I've looked at a community called Normal Illinois. Now, I, I've ne I never knew there was a Normal <laughs> Illinois. I'll admit it. Uh, but they have done this remarkable traffic circle on about the same size space. Theirs went, went further than I'd like ours to go. Let me be clear about that. Because theirs actually incorporates a park mm. and has water features and people and has crosswalks that go into it. It's actually next to a train station. But it's in one end of their downtown. Mm. And while one might argue that you could say this is a different end of downtown, I don't I don't want to park in the center of 38,000 cars a day coming across. <laughs> uh, but I do want to incorporate some of their remarkable, sustainable design that deals with those water issues and the traffic issues at the same time. And I think we have an opportunity now to do that. You ought to do what South Bend, Indiana did. 
What did they, they do? Now, they, I've heard of South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> well, we went to school out there, but they have the river going right through the town, just like we do. And uh, they took a, a, a side thing and made it for uh, uh, whitewater rafting and kayaking. Really? And they actually had the Olympic trials there a couple no of years kidding. ago. Yeah, we're going to have to speed up the river a little bit. Well, the Merrimack goes a little <laughs> no, faster, just... but it needs to be a little cleaner, I think. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think. Uh, uh, this wasn't a very good one in the beginning either. Right. But they've cleaned up the area, and if all you have to do is raise the level a little bit, you know, and uh, you It's come a long to... way. And oh, it's come a long way. Yeah. When I... Uh, when I first moved into the house where I live now, uh, back in the 80s, it's close to the river and it's close to the landfill, and you never knew. Was that smell the landfill? Was that <laughs> smell the river? You didn't know. So, I mean, it really yeah. has come a long way. I think people I used to uh, fish that are really I trying to. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd go down to the, 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 the Merrimack, borrow my dad's pole, and I'd see the sewage going right into the Merrimack, mm. and I'd be fishing for carp. I'd I just wanted to catch a fish. <laughs> but what a horrible sight that was. But it's oh. come a long, long way. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, Nashville, you know, we have a 60 million gallon treatment plant. We don't, right. none of that happens in our, you know, I mean, what we're trying to overcome is, you know, high rain events and how do you do that when, it, when it's over um, what the system can, can handle when it's over capacity. So, you know, that's part of uh, mm -hmm. some of what we're doing too. So. There's just, as I said earlier, when we started, there's so many things going on. I could yeah. you know, chat about Yeah, well, that's about what we're trying to find time. out. And a lot of communities are doing that. I lived in Chelmsford, Massachusetts for 28 years before I came up here. and uh, Before you saw the light? Well, I, I knew I wasn't <laughs> going back to Massachusetts when I uh, left there. But uh, what I was thinking of was the time when I moved there, and everybody was blaming Nashua and communities up north course, because the river was go coming downstream. And uh, then I looked at uh, what Lowell's done with their waterways and everything. They've done a lot of jobs. No, I agree. There's a lot of opportunity. The yeah. development that we've, uh, you may have heard us mention, Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, so it's to the north side of East Hollis Street. Mm -hmm. But it runs right along the Merrimack. And part of their uh, site plan development includes a waterfront promenade for mm -hmm. the public. Mm -hmm. To be able to stroll along, you know, the mm -hmm. front of the Merrimack, which we really don't, we, we, we don't do that. And it'd be nice to have that uh, opportunity there. So. What do you think about that uh, proposal for a new gas tax? Oh, ah, the gas tax. What do you think about that? Do you think there'll be a mass exodus to across the border to buy gas? No, you know what <laughs> I'm I, just... <laughs> no, I know. Well, what, well, you know, having all been elected officials, mm -hmm. nobody ever likes to say I'm raising a tax. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes That's that. That's a big one. It is. But here's what I think people need to remember about the gas tax. So for every one cent, it's like eight and a half million dollars that you raise. We haven't raised it since what, in the 90s? Yeah. Okay. So if you look all around us, we're this little pocket again of, of the bastion of no more taxes, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's fine. But What's happened in those other communities when they've raised their gas tax, and if you look at it closely, this is what you will see. Their gas price hasn't changed. That gas tax is not passed on to the resident. It's not passed on to the user. It's the companies providing the oil and the gas, they're eating that tax because they don't want to have that be the problem. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the border communities, you will see that the prices are competitive. And so I think we're missing the boat here if we don't do something. I, I, because somehow people are going to pay for the road work that has to be done. The bridges that are in trouble. Though I, I mean, I look at Nashua. I have 303 miles of street, 765 lane miles, OK? We put about a million dollars in that budget a year. I need $4 million to get it right. Mm -hmm. Now, people call me about their streets and how long it's been, and, and they're right. And we need to come up with a plan for how are we going to do this going forward because we can't sit back and lose these roads. Reclaiming a road, which means it deteriorated beyond the point of just being able to pave it. Now you've got to dig it all up and regrade it and do all that. It's going to cost you three, four, even five times, depending on the road, the price of paving it. We can't lose sight of that. And if the gas tax provides a way for us to maintain the infrastructure that we haven't been able to provide, and it's a tax that doesn't end up being on the consumer because that four cents, you know, or whatever it might be, just gets rolled into that. 
I'm okay with them getting a little less profit if we can get our roads done. The problem is people are hearing it and assuming that it's going to be passed on to them. But if they look at the numbers, and Nashville's a perfect city for Representative Campbell to use it as, a, as an example. Because if you look at even the area we were just talking about, Tingsboro, near the Pheasant Lane Mall, people are driving in. Gas prices, there's not some big deal difference in, at the Cumberland Farms next to the Pheasant Lane Mall than there is at the one in Tingsboro. And, yeah, and right. they've got a gas tax that's significantly higher than ours. Mm -hmm. So where's that tax showing up? Showing up on the other side of the ledger, and I, I'm okay with them having it. What about the rest of the you know? state mm -hmm. uh, right now because of the uh, mix or the formulation of the gas? Uh, I think that's one reason they say that up in Concord, gas is cheaper than it is down here. Well, actually, in the Lakes region, it's even cheaper. You go up to Tilton, it's, it's actually cheaper up there. They have, to, they have to change it a little bit more because of the lakes. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I can't really speak too much mm -hmm. to that, and I don't know what it means for communities that are not border town. I mean, mm -hmm. I've concentrated so much on the border communities because we have different angst here than you do somewhere else. So, mm -hmm. um, um, but, but I think that that's a... I, I think that that's a, a tax that could provide um, a real benefit. I, I remember when I was, at, I was a city councilor up in Franklin for a little while, and one of the, one of the things that we were considering were the, the pipes. They were very old in, underneath those, those roads that need to be paved. How are we doing in Nashua with that? Mm. <laughs> well, it depends on the pipes, right? right. So uh, interestingly enough, Penichuk and the city are about the same age. Mm -hmm. Okay, Penichuk's actually a little bit older, I think, if I have it right. And so when you look at Penichuk, we have about 50 miles of unlined pipe that needs some work. Uh, they're in better shape than we are. So when you look at the city's pipes that are under the road, and just so we're clear, our pipes are, you know, your stormwater and your, we'll call it sanitary sewer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're pipes that are really old that need to be replaced. And so when we have a collapse, one of the problems is like Lake Street's a great example. We had a, we had a collapse there my first year as mayor. And you get in there, I know, I'm telling you, we've had 100 year floods of tornadoes, hurricanes. <laughs> but, so we had a collapse and you know, the pipe goes down. So they're in there and they're fixing it. And as they're fixing it, it's breaking, it's breaking. It's, you know, exactly. So you end up, right? Yep. Um, so, so that's, something that we're trying to get ahead of. Um, not because we could afford to replace them all. But Eventually you're gonna have to. Right. Right, yeah. So we're working on, every time we pave a street, we go in and we video camera the lines yep. um, to make sure that we're not gonna end up with a sore collapse to find out. A lot of our older pipes, the bottom is just gone. So it's sitting in, you know, just the dirt. Uh, the top's still there. So in some places we line them, mm -hmm. in some places we replace them. Some places we repair them. Uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, and, and as I said, as we do road projects. So take uh, the work that we're doing with the Broad Street Parkway. So Pine and Palm Street are streets that we really got into. And, you know, we changed some of the configurations, things like that. Well, the water pipes have been replaced there. You know, the sewer pipes have been replaced. I mean, soup to nuts. Everything's being done right. Dumb question. Um, Does the gas tax help with that? Well, actually, uh, the gas tax we'll get a contribution of the gas tax. So about 12% of the revenue raised will come back to municipalities. Mm -hmm. I haven't done the math to see what that means for Nashville, mm -hmm. but anything that I can add to the paving budget, to the infrastructure, right. you know, we, really need, we really need to be talking about that. It's yeah. important. A lot of people forget that. You, know, you, can, you, you see the potholes, but there's more to, 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 that's to it than that. Oh, it is. Well, in that, this time of the year, when people are talking about potholes, I mean, think about what we're doing this time of the year. So you've got the frost eaves, you've got the plows, you've mm -hmm. got, and then you have the potholes. And some of them are just, you know, delaminated where the, just kind of peels off. Yeah. And so we put in a new program a couple years ago called Mill and Fill, where you actually take out a big section of road and you just replace it where you've got problem potholes. But this time of the year, when we have those potholes, Really, all we can do is fill them with what's called coal patch. Yep. Well, that doesn't stay very long. No, it You're doesn't. I, I fixed into, one you know, the other day. So they just keep coming out. Right. So it's a tough time of the year, and um, and it's a good opportunity mm -hmm. to hone your defensive driving skills. Yeah. Uh, just mark. You see them soon yeah. enough. <laughs> I, said, I, I fixed one a couple of weeks ago, and uh, after the, the plowing at it, it, it Hollis Crossing. The plow, the rain, the, they, you know, you just can't keep up them with, the, you know, the temperatures what they are. It just right. doesn't work. So. You know, we'll continue to fill them and we'll do what we can do, but there are a lot of roads in this, in this city that 
need the attention of being paved, and we've got to come up with a better way uh, and a cost-effective way to do something about that. Well, Mayor, it's, uh, time is running out. And, Imagine uh, that. Uh, <laughs> Just like that. I enjoyed talking with you, Thank and you. Uh, hopefully uh, a lot of these problems will, I wouldn't say go away, but will be resolved in a favorable manner. Uh, like infrastructure, they're always going to be around, and everybody wants a piece of the money. I don't know whether we're going to get anything to cover all this, uh, you know, I mean, if you get, you get everything you want for infrastructure, there's, maybe you get everything you want for the train, but I doubt that. <laughs> oh, no, and I don't think, you know, as I said, there's a lot of hard questions yeah, around yeah. the rail. Once that report comes back, there's a lot of hard questions and decisions that have to be made. Can we afford the operating cost? What would it be like for a subsidy? Am I picking between pavement or rails? I mean, you know, those are some of the things that I, I'm hearing you say. Well, that's, yeah. And I don't think we'll get something for everything. But I think what's important is, I think our job as the people that are responsible and being good stewards of the city right now is, we've got to make sure that we're thinking ahead. Yep. We've got to make sure that we have viable plans that mm -hmm. people can understand and gather around. We've done that with things like our wastewater. Mm -hmm. Because we have a consent decree, we've planned out you know, a lot of the work that has to mm -hmm. be done and how that gets paid for. We've got to do that for a lot of things. And we have we have to make sure that our citizens understand where their money is being spent so they mm -hmm. feel like they're getting the value that they want to have. I think that's the biggest part, too. Yep. People have to understand that you get what you pay for. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> funny because somebody says, oh, you know, you, you seem to raise the tax every year. And that's true. Yeah. Uh, you know, my first year it was under 1%. My second year was a revaluation, so really 75% paid less or the same. Uh, and each year thereafter, it's been under 3%. This past year, it was 2.5%. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a person that believes in good government and facing the reality. And the reality is the cost of doing business goes up every mm -hmm. year. So unless you're going to eliminate services and still expect people to pay the same amount of money, then you're going to have to give some of those up. And... And I think as long as we maintain some stability in the tax rate so people understand, I don't think the tax rate should ever go up beyond 3%. So anything in that window that delivers that same high level of service that people come to expect and allow for us to plan for other expenses and things that are coming along, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the right way to do business. And I'll tell you, people say, oh, you know, you ought to run government like a business. Well, you can't for any number of reasons that mm -hmm. we don't have time to mm -hmm. talk about tonight. But you can certainly incorporate good business practices. Mm -hmm. And good mm -hmm. businesses understand that you have to invest back into that business. Mm -hmm. And there's a cost associated with mm -hmm. that. You want the businesses to continue coming to Nashua. Well, exactly. I, I mean, so if I'm going to come to Nashua, I don't want to read headlines about mm -hmm. teachers being laid off in droves uh, like other communities have had to deal with. Because one of the first questions people ask me when they come here is, how are the schools? That's right. You know, how are the services? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I, you know, that kind of, you want, you want companies to stay, you want them to grow, you want new ones to come. And as I explained to our residents, that grows the tax base, base. in a way that is less burden for the residents. And we're starting to see some of that and That's change. what we're, they were trying to do up there in Concord, too. Right. Uh, exactly. Hopefully they can do that. You grow the base and you all benefit that yeah, way. Yeah, politics is easy sure. to push those <laughs> increases off for another time or ignore them during yeah. an election year, yeah. it's not the right thing yeah. to do. One, one of the things that's not going away is the pensions and the unfunded mandates and all that. And you put There's on that seminar, it. which was very, was very eye-opening, and uh, that's something that's definitely going to be dealt with. I think most people understand if you talk to them about it and you put it in perspective. Mm. So when you look at the average homeowner uh, in Nashua, their taxes have increased between 10 and $12 a month each year. It's hard to argue that you're not getting a value for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, as I said, is you, you still have all of those remarkable services that bring people to communities like Nashville from other places. Mm -hmm. They want those. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we need to provide it. We need to stay a vibrant city. And we need to you know, make sure that we're meeting those demands. I, I think we're doing a pretty good job at it. I so think you, around here. You, pro think. you provide a good way of communicating with you. You have a good website. And uh, I don't know how many people do take the time to You'd talk to you. You'd be surprised a lot. Well, <laughs> oh, I thought you meant talk to I, I thought you were going to ask me how many take the time to go to the website. A lot. <laughs> uh, talking to me, um, you know, I, I love being out. I love hearing from people. Uh -huh, I mean, uh -huh. I, as you can tell, I, I, I think I'm, I'm people, a talker. 
but I'm a really good listener. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you're doing a good job. Thanks. So I appreciate we'll, we'll, that. Uh, nice to we'll be here. We'll have you back down again uh, to talk about it later on in the year. Sure. Let's you know where to find me. Out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and you're thank welcome. you, audience, for listening in. Don't forget the People's View is a uh, program that's sponsored by the Nashua Republican City Committee, and their website is nashuagop.org. If you want to find out more about the organization, we meet every uh, second Tuesday, the, uh, Thursday of the month uh, at the Crown Plaza. So please come down, listen to our speakers, and get communicate with us as if for any speakers you'd like to hear in the future. Thank you for listening in. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor.